And the winner is, God show. How are your knees? Wobbling. Well, okay. And the winner is, hmm, Dave Graney, The Soft and Sexy Sound. This year, the many faces of Melbourne's Dave Graney became soft and sexy as he took another U-turn in his ever-evolving songbook. King of Pop. Um, yeah, this is a uh, bit of a trip, and um, I'm not really a solo artist, so uh, I must, of course, accept this on behalf of my wife and a musical collaborator for uh, uh, almost 20 years, Claire Moore, and um, the other members of the Coral Snakes, Rod Hayward, Gordy Blair, and Robin Cassinada. And uh, I'll thank, um, I'll thank uh, in no particular order, Roger Grierson from Polygram Music Publishing for dragging me out of the gutter. He's probably keeping a dozen people alive at the moment. And uh, um, Mick Geyer and Michael Lynch and uh, Adam Yaxi from Id Records, who has uh, delivered our ideas uh, with great empathy to the music business. And uh, um, everybody from Mercury and Polygram. And uh, the king is dead. Long live the king. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the Voodoo Room, Mr. Dave Franey. Good afternoon, Dave. How are you? Good, thanks, Pete. How are you going? Good, thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure having you here, and I uh, appreciate your time. You were the best male artist in 1996, Dave. How did, you manage, was. How did you manage the pressure of a prestigious award? Um. Yeah, I'd, I'd spent my life as an underground musician, so it was novelty being involved in the music business. You know, working with a record label, a small one attached to a large one. So it was a novel experience and it was a great time, great time for Australian music. I'm talking about the early to uh, mid-90s. I won that award in 1996. I'd been playing in the underworld of, of Melbourne music from about 1980, 81, completely, you know, under, underground, underworld, not, not at all touching any mainstream areas. Went to uh, the UK to, and lived there mostly from uh, late 83 to late 88 and uh, came back and the Australian music scene, which we had left because we couldn't see any future for us in it, like a lot of our generation, didn't seem any better. It was really, uh, to me, it, it was, um, uh, although the Melbourne live music scene was quite incredible after London, which is very primitive. London, London didn't have the... Uh, uh, the gig, great gigs you could just walk into or the audience that would just turn up for things without, without you know, being told what it was. 
So, uh, yeah, so I love that part of the Australian music thing anyway. So uh, we, we were undeniably a really good uh, band a- and we had skills. We had uh, like, like a boxer, we had legs. We, had, we could punch and we could keep our legs and we just had balance and poise. And so undeniably uh, the best, yeah. It was, it was me for that time. It was me. Uh, uh, the other people up for it were Tex Perkins, also undeniably the best. And uh, I think Paul Kelly as well. He won it the year afterwards. So. And anyway, so uh, but, uh, un- until then we'd been working with a label with a, 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 a champion a guy who, who represented us to the rest of the company. After I won that award, the rest of the company knew who I was and were wanting to put their, their mark on it. And so it was downhill from there really. So you asked about how did I handle the pressure? Yeah. Probably not very well because uh, we, we, after that we kind of lost our protection of that A&R guy who left, which everybody that was who's a, ever that, been with. That was you know, Adam Yahtzee. That's right, yeah. yeah. Everybody yeah. who's ever been with a big label knows you need one person there to uh, to do that. Yeah. yeah. I met him briefly because um, I think he was um, doing something with the Warner Brothers back yeah. in that period of time. Yeah, he, he, he worked out of Melbourne first. He started working with a thing at Mushroom Records. They had a a little back office called Mushroom Distribution Services, which was their way of, of importing records, in, uh, working import records within Australia, and that's where Adam came from. He was a Melbourne person. But then he just got this job in um, Sydney, and uh, and he's been up there ever since. But yeah, he, so he had quite strong links to Melbourne people. The Warner Brothers and Titus uh, were also on this little label called uh, ID or ID, which which was uh, became a part of um, uh, the Polygram group. I mean, it seemed like at the time that things were looking, like you said, it was looking pretty rosy for a lot of Australian bands. Um, and then the scene sort of changed with all of a sudden within a matter of 12 months. Um, things seem to have decreased a little bit with the interest, with the uh, greater um, manufacturing of the record label. Right. Would you agree with that, that it, took, it was about a 12-month period, two years, and then it sort um, of... We worked with them for three albums. They distributed an album we uh, recorded and made and made the plates for called Night of the Wolverine. Then we signed with them and uh, did one called You Want to Be There But You Don't Want to Travel in 1994, The Soft and Sexy Sound in 1995, and The Devil Drives in 1997. Um, and uh, had a really great time, really, really loved it. And the business really changed during that time we were with them. Um, it, it had much more people in it at the beginning. There were more record shops. There were there were charts, that sort of thing. Each and each state had its own charts, and those charts could be uh, rigged at the at the at the begin at the beginning of it. And you go around these little shops that were the chart shops that were supposed to be secret, and you'd see how it all worked. But and uh, it sounds crooked, but it was people. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't crooked in some ways because it was people talking to each other and trying to make things happen. You know? um, and also Triple J went national at exact that same time and that was that had about the same effect as in the mid-70s when Countdown uh, started because it was a national broadcast of music that was possible all of a sudden. And they needed people who were touring nationally to... Uh, to hop on the back of in a way, so so it was a, it was kind of uh, us and a, a couple of other people, especially the Cruel Sea and people like the Foves, a lot of people who were on Polygram. But I think internationally at that time there were a lot of uh, left field artists being um, 
funded by large labels. Uh, I mean, in the UK, especially Polygram and Ireland, there was Tricky and there was uh, people like Blur and Pulp and uh, a lot of those uh, Brit pop kinds of things. And then it, it kind of um, it, it, something, it ran out of, uh, it got too smart for itself or something, I don't know, or, or it was the beginning of the kind of uh, digital world uh, towards the end of the 90s. Uh, for instance, they used to have people who would go around uh, talking up records personally to record shops. They say, this is a really hot record, you should get onto this or radio stations. And they just uh, got rid of all of those people and just would, would be a call centre doing it. Or And then it became emails, you know, automated and, and it would just lost people. It's, yeah, it lost its soul. big difference. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, just um, in terms of uh, your English uh, period, uh, when did you decide to leave Melbourne and travel to England and how did this period change your music and what was the most significant influence this had on you at that time? Um, well, we were part of a kind of international kind of post-punk scene really and uh, people would come to Melbourne, like the fall from Manchester, who were, were buying all their records. You know, I used to buy records by labels like Postcard in, uh, in Glasgow, indie labels, and uh, it, was, it seemed to be a very dramatic and, uh, and just a uh, happening scene in the UK. And Australia was still ruled by a kind of world where you'd have to go and slug it out in, in uh, pubs and... Uh, and we were in a band called The Moodists in Melbourne. We only played in Melbourne, like St Kilda or Darlinghurst, no, nowhere outside that. At one stage before we left, we, we got invited to uh, work with a booking agency and we went out to somewhere, probably out where I live now, out, uh, I don't know, uh, out towards Ferntree Gully or something to watch a band play. And uh, it was just a big pub. And uh, it was Chain or someone playing, and uh, we just knew it, it. You know, we would have got slaughtered in there. I mean, our music was pretty rough and, and loud, but uh, we would have offended them. And uh, we uh, so uh, and and all of our peers were leaving, and uh, we we played at the going away party for the go betweens. You know, they were living in Melbourne at the time and also the Laughing Clowns. And one by one they would go, following in the uh, footsteps of the Saints and the birthday party who all went to London. Nobody much thought to go to America, only one or out of that underworld scene, I mean, like one was the Lipstick Killers out of Sydney. Uh, so we went to... London, the only experience we'd had in Melbourne recording studios, they were $1,000 a day in, say, 1981. They're like $600 a day in 2020, 21, you know, and, and there's probably only one or two like that, uh, you know, with large rooms, I mean. And they were all built for advertising in, in Melbourne. Uh, the sounds were, were dull and they used a lot of digital kind of mach machines, like digital reverbs, that kind of thing. We signed to a British indie and we went to a studio in Wood Green and the Yardbirds had reformed and they were sitting in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, TV room watching porno movies on VHS. And uh, we were in a studio which was all great stone walls, like an old church. And, and the drum sounds Claire got out of her Gretsch kit were just fucking great, and and it and it was say five years ahead of Australia in the studio environment, and the studio uh, studio aesthetic was informed by musical things, mm. not by advertising. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because I mean I was only a ten year old boy in nineteen eighty one. And um, I wasn't aware of uh, how primitive, because it does sound pretty primitive, the uh, recording studios around that time. I mean, 
I think from memory, from my understanding, it was Ali Armstrong's and Richmond Recorders. I think they were yeah. the two that were around from my research. In Melbourne, yeah. Yeah, in Melbourne, yeah. And um, we so, had an experience at a small one in South Melbourne. And I guess that's what I mean by advertising, yeah. yeah. They treated us like uh, idiots and you'd, you'd never really be welcome in the control room. And uh, the whole generation of, of us were kind of uh, thought that the, the engineers and that were the enemy. Yeah, you know, right. They were there to uh, kill your sound. <laughs> and uh, it, it was an attitude and it continued on until long after. And so Tony Cohen was an engineer who was very uh, – very good because he was like one of us. Yeah. You know? that, that was his thing. He, he, you could communicate with him. He wasn't uh, there to kill your sound. He was there to, kind of to bring, enhance bring it. it out. Yeah. yeah. No, he was terrific because I did some work with Tony and mm. um, uh, my experience was, with him was uh, he was very unorthodox in comparison to the other engineers I was working with, which was yeah. terrific because I really – found that you could use your own voice with him and he could, he would take it on and he would see something within what you're doing and he but rather than criticising what you're doing, he would actually see the good in what you're doing hmm. um, and that's what I found with him. But um, just getting back uh, to the beginnings, I guess, uh, you grew up in Mount Gambia. Hmm. Um, how, how was it growing up in a place like Mount Gambia and what influenced you to perform? Uh, well, look. That's a long, long time ago now, but um, well, it was great growing up there. It's a lovely place. Uh, the Blue Lake, beautiful natural beauty, mm. and uh, lots of uh, it was a kind of blue collar working town, uh, timber mills surrounded by uh, you know uh, pine forests, and uh, yeah, kind of thriving working town. Uh, 300 miles one way to Adelaide and 300 miles the other to uh, Melbourne and had a fantastic football league and uh, and uh, my uh, the, the biggest influences on me growing up were football you know like and uh, and pop music was I was I grew up as a kid in the 60s teenager in the 70s it was the era of of music before it became uh, in any way retrospective. There was no classic rock. There were, it was, everything was new all the time. And so I, I heard it all in real time. I mean, the Beatles and the Stones and disco and punk. And so, uh, um, yeah, I, I didn't see much live music. I, there was a, maybe uh, six events in my teenage years. I, I saw the Masters Apprentices play when I was about um, 10 years old. I was at, in a theatre. Uh, a few years later in the same place, I saw a, a package tour by Mushroom Records, which was like the, the Dingoes and Chain uh, and, and another one which had, um, I think, Madder Lake and... Uh, I saw Johnny O'Keefe playing at a beer festival, you know, uh, you know, just out sweating it out outside to a, a bunch of. We were all just drunk most of the time, uh, any time we could. So um, it was a uh, fierce, uh, fierce place. It was South Australian. It was kind of a great time to grow up. South Australia was a uh, place that. Um, I don't know it was had a great uh, um, feeling of being a progressive place because of the, the Premier Don Dunstan, who was who led the way for Gough Whitlam, Labor politicians, and it was uh, just a great progressive place. And um, uh, so yeah, I, I moved from Mount Gambia. You know, I finished high school, got a job in a timber mill. Uh, Took a drive around the east coast of Australia, then uh, moved to Adelaide and just sat around. I was kind of fired up by punk rock and I wanted to uh, to uh, kind of pursue that. I thought it was a world uh, that I was uh, I could be in, in a way, but it was very frustrating for a 
you know, quite a long time because my uh, ambitions were far beyond my abilities. And I, I moved to Melbourne after about 18 months or two years and and because I liked the Mel- Melbourne music and uh, and uh, then I moved to London after a couple of few, a few years there. Yeah. So you moved to Melbourne in 1980, is that correct? 80, 81, around 80, that time. Yeah. Yeah. So this was the height of the new punk scene. Uh, where did you fit in within the music of the time and were there any notable moments? Uh, well, it was great. Um, it was kind of the boys next door had left Melbourne, so they, le- they left a kind of vacuum. So it was kind of a, a, a scene w- which had a bit of a, a void at its centre and uh, we used to play at the CV Ballroom in St Kilda and we used to rehearse there. There was the, the Exford Hotel in the city, in Ch- uh, the corner of Chinatown, and uh, a few other venues, but very few. Uh, lived in different parts of Melbourne, Richmond, and Moorabbin, and um, Pran, and uh, the CV Ballroom was a wonderful place to play music in. It was a, a dilapidated hotel, uh, like fallen to a grandeur, fallen. Uh, you know, into uh, disrepair, but it still had wonderful older people still living in it, and it had a ca- a lift that you know with a cage that went up to their their rooms, and it had a ballroom in it that had a sprung floor, and it was quite uh, beautiful, and it was uh, you know a stairway like out of Gone with the Wind leading up, you know it was beautiful. Uh, the CV Ballroom was there, and the Prince of Wales, and then the uh, Esplanade around the corner. The Esplanade was uh, more like it always was a place for blow ins on the weekend, but the CV Ballroom was a place for a subculture. And there's also the venue around that time as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. That was around the old ice skating place. Yeah. Uh, the CV Ballroom was a distinct place that, that, uh, that it was a culture, a culture. And, yeah. Uh, and it was run by a uh, Great guy Graham Richmond, who was president of the Richmond Football Club, and uh, he, he was a really great guy. And uh, all those pubs had uh, really fascinating characters uh, running them. But Melbourne was still. We'd come from Adelaide, which had pubs open till three a.m. It was real, real kind of. And we were we were big beer drinking people, and we were we were like blue collar types. And Melbourne seemed quite effete. And uh, full of heroin, and uh, and and we didn't want any part of that. And uh, it also shut up at ten p.m. It was dead at ten p.m. And uh, Easter was a horrific period that used to last for it seemed <laughs> like ten days. And there'd always be a beer strike just before Easter, yeah. and you'd have to drink some foreign drink from Perth or. Uh, worse Queensland and uh, it, it was quite so your choices weren't much which you know you know people have so much choice you know in, in the modern world you know even over beer you know they, they have they'll pay thirty dollars for some stinking beer made by <laughs> some clown in his lounge room and, I know uh, I know call it craft beer or something I know I, I went out <laughs> last night and I, I'm not a beer drinker and you know, the last time I looked at uh, a bar tab, uh, yeah. it had Stella and VB and CUB. Yeah. C-U-B. <laughs> I mean, they had none of that. It was all this the other. And I've gone, which is a nice beer? And he said, this one. And I said, I'll take one of those, thanks, you know. Yeah. But um, then no, he gives you the bill. <laughs> then he gives you the bill, yeah, and you're just <laughs> horrified. But um, you, you, you're known for your sense of style. Where did that right. come from, Dave? Because you're always, uh, and you're the slickest dresser I've ever right. come across. Well, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I don't know whether to say thank you or not because uh, I'd. Uh, no, but you are. I mean, got it's in the habit of it. Yeah. Like uh, I grew up and there were lots of, uh, you know, op shops and, uh, you know, uh, disposal store you get old army gear and that kind of stuff and nothing i ever liked like many people you know, of my generation nothing i liked was on the rack you know it, we were ahead of fashion and uh 
So got in the habit of just looking for stuff and reclaiming it, whatever. And it was the same with music in some ways. And uh, still, I'm still, I've, I've always been like that, you know. Uh, I go to shops full of clothes and um, you know, I went to Maya today and it just looked quite it's full of stuff if you wanted to dress like Sam Newman. <laughs> but I don't want to. <laughs> floppy casual yeah, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's like you're just you're coming off the yacht, you know, <laughs> for your six o'clock dinner. That's right. Yeah. Um. So I know that. But, uh, but I've I've always liked R and B music in yeah. a way. And when we went to the UK, I heard more black music. And uh, you know, the, when I first got to London in '83, I bought a double album by Sly and the Family Stone. And, and I'd never really heard much of them, but yeah, it was just mind blowing. The, totally. The, the sound on it. And Australia has never been really in no. a mainstream touched by a lot of black music. No, it hasn't. No, unfortunately. And they were always great, you know, uh, dresses, you know. Yeah, totally. I mean, reggae was popular back then as well. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, UB40 and all those types yeah. of bands that came out of yeah. the UK. Um, Lou Reed, uh, you, you, how has Lou Reed influenced your work? Because I know you're a fan of Lou Reed. Mm. Um, well, he was he hit big when I was in my teens, you know, with uh, with um, Transformer, the album produced by David Bowie. But I really love Rock and Roll Animal, which all people who like the Velvet Underground say is just a travesty. But <laughs> I really love it, and. Uh, I kept up with his work up, up until about 1989. I keep hearing a lot of his later work I missed out on and it was really, really good. And I admire the way he conducted himself all through his career as an artist. You know, he only really respected other musicians. You know, I think that's really funny. And, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I like, uh, I find it fascinating uh, that that music uh, in a way, I've come to see it as as conservative in some ways. The Velvet Underground, because um, a lot of them, that feeling that were, that led to punk rock, was in some ways conservative. They wanted to go backwards rather than forwards. Uh, some of it, some of it, it, of course, it made something else. But they were looking back, like the Ramones, to classic uh, pop, like. Uh, Pop music and, and they were trying to get away from prog rock or whatever. But yeah, the Velvets were, had had that element as well as early twentieth century avant garde music as well. But yeah, I, I really liked his uh, the way he uh, Lou Reed uh, uh, expressed himself quite simply. Yeah, yeah. I you know if it sounds like I copied him. No, not no, at all. No, I'm no, quite no, happy. no, no. <laughs> I'm quite happy with no, that. No, no, because I, I know I heard a podcast and you were talking about Lou Reed, and uh, oh right, yeah. and that's why I asked because oh um, one particular record I really loved uh, called Coney Island Baby, which, uh, which, uh, after my band The Moodist finished playing, I thought I'd be a singer, songwriter type, but I didn't want to be, you know, like. Uh, a sad guy with an acoustic guitar. I wanted to be like Lou Reed with yeah. an electric guitar and a great band yeah. uh, or Tim Buckley or Fred Neal, that, mm. that sort of songwriter. Yeah. Oh, you definitely are. You, your songs are, you know, your, lyric, your lyrics are uh, really descriptive and uh, really quirky in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're terrific. So what, what have you been doing uh, during the covert slowdown, did you were you making records during that period of time, or just started experimenting uh, with different things? And I've written a lot of songs and tried to capture them, but haven't really finished anything. Recording for me, or is mainly about finishing ideas. So I've just been catching uh, ideas, and uh, some of them I used a Tascam 4-track just as an exercise to try and, uh, you know, just to try and make myself think about uh, recording or or, uh, or, uh, or music or capturing it in that way. And uh, otherwise I've uh, mixed a couple of live albums we put out 
uh, from different periods and uh, put them out digitally, um, you know, from uh, with different, one was just myself and Claire and our old piano player Robin uh, at a gig in early February. Another one was from a tour in 2017 with uh, our old friend Malcolm from Edinburgh on guitar and uh, Malcolm Ross and uh, Giorgio Valentino on bass. And um, we did a great gig at Bird's Basement and I was going to mix some of that and put it out too, just digitally. Um, we... Uh, but uh, otherwise, just been writing uh, and enjoying uh, doing um, in instrumentals and uh, doing online live performances via a platform called Stage It that we uh, got to do. And uh, uh, so far, we've done uh, about 52 performances. You know, and uh, people sort of pay to get in and. Uh, we have to put on uh, a show from our studio and uh, had to get up to speed with the technology and you know, understand the, all the variables involved, the internet itself and the browsers, that sort of thing. So, uh, and, you know, uh, yeah, it was really, it's quite, you know, uh, a stressful like any gig and uh, exciting and it has element of of uh being social because people can you know chat and uh they they show up each week it's been it's been really quite good we do one each week on thursday nights at 8 p.m for people and then we do another one every second sunday at 8 a.m for people in the northern hemisphere okay that's very considerate uh -huh. um how did you meet your wife, Claire Moore, uh, and what's it like to work in a band with your wife? Right. Uh, well, we just met in the Adelaide music scene and started playing music together. And uh, I think people are, people who have relationships uh, where one is in the music world and the other is outside of it have much more problems than if you're both in it. because if if one is outside, this one has to go over and explain to the other one, you know, what happened, why didn't it work, you know, what did you do wrong? But if you're both in it, you just know. <laughs> <laughs> you tried your best, yeah. nothing worked. Yeah. Who who knows? Yeah. <laughs> just try again. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. So, uh, what it's like, it's much easier if you're both. In it. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, how do you approach your songwriting and what process, processes do you go through when you uh, begin a song? Uh, well, words, uh, words uh, you know, always there as long as you've got a, a voice. The thing in if you're writing songs is to have a voice, a tone of voice. Um, that you can put your songs to and uh, that's the thing that you have to have first and that's like having a flow it's like uh, tapping a flow and uh, then it's uh, once you've got that you know I, I've never been uh, uh, approaching it in a systematic or any kind of way never thought that a particular person wrote the best kind of song, like uh, you know the Beatles, you know, uh, for instance, uh, they're songwriters I admire, but um, they're more from uh, the jazz or R and B world. Um, you know, great songwriters I think is like Leon Russell, his, his incredible skills. Uh, Paul Westerberg from The Replacements, um, uh, a guy called uh, from uh, August Darnell who who has a had a has an act called Kid Creole and the Coconuts. Oh yeah, great. Uh, Niall Rogers, just yeah. incredible writer producer. Mm. Uh, 
I actually did uh, monitors for Kid Carroll on the coconuts. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think he's a genius. Oh, he's terrific, man. Yeah, he's I, I, like, and he's uh, also a classy dresser. He is, yeah. yeah. I read he uh, went into a warehouse in New York or something in uh, the late 70s and it was full of untouched a zoot suit era clothes wow. that he just bought all of them. <laughs> I can imagine. Oh, he looks sens- he looks sensational. Yeah, yeah. He- he's from a really sophisticated range uh, world. He, he really, uh, I think he works mainly in Europe. Uh, mm. But yeah, from the- he looks like something, and uh, and in some ways it is artifice. He looks like something from the nineteen. 19- 1920s. Yeah, because when I saw him yeah. for the first time, I thought he looked like Kid Calloway. Yeah, yeah, from that yeah, that, that world, world Cotton Club yeah. kind of world. Yeah, yeah. Duke Ellington yeah. or Cab Calloway or yeah, yeah. New Orleans somewhere yeah. from around that time, uh, and with all that kind of racial uh, mixture and uh, class. Uh, you know, uh, yes, so I really like him and. Uh, yeah, so my songwriting, you know, I, I just uh, always I got obsessed with playing guitar. About after my period with the Coral Snakes, where all throughout time I was just standing there and singing, and then after that, or towards the end of that, I got obsessed with becoming more centered in music. And and to help me do that, I wanted to play guitar and sing, not be so much of a showman. I yeah. was I was a bit bored with that. Okay. How did you find uh, supporting hunters and collectors and carting their stinky PA? Well, that was in 1993, and it was a bit of a shock that they were still doing that. It was uh, used to be a thing of Australian bands would make the support band load the PA in, that kind of thing. Right. So, um, so, So you would load the PA for both bands that they would use in the pub? You'd have to provide two loaders in and out and if you were from a, a band that only ever played at a couple of pubs in the inner city you didn't have loaders so that'd always be just drunk friends who'd be less help than more of a hindrance than anything you know wearing R. M. williams boots or something but hunters and collectors famously always owned their own pa so yes yeah, so they uh but they still uh, passed it on. It was like coming from some brutality of a private school or something. <laughs> and they passed it on the pain. <laughs> but um, th- that was funny because they were old friends of ours. We-, we used to go and see the hunters and collectors, like Mark and John and Doug, before the hunters and collectors. They were in a group called the Jetsons and we used to go and see them. And uh, we saw the hunters and collectors' first gigs when they were all in fancy frilly shirts like Duran Duran or something, and uh, saw that saw them through different periods, and uh, it was, we toured with them in 1993 for about six weeks, and uh, uh, it was quite eye-opening going because they could, they were almost, probably the last of that uh, era of bands uh, who who could just go anywhere. They never played in the centre of a city, really. That they'd go go out uh, for weeks around New South Wales, and they could draw five hundred to a thousand people yeah. anywhere. Because you have seen the music industry change during your career. What what's been the most significant change? Um, <clears throat> I think just, you know people all, always. Uh, I don't know. Just people's notions of things. Uh, just, uh, I think it w- when it became really retrospective, it, it uh, produced uh, what FM radio is today. You know, like uh, classic rock. It's just horrible. It wasn't always that way. Um, it used to be more of a music culture. And there used to be great music magazines. Um, uh, that were just specifically about music, and at some point in the '90s, they all disappeared, and it became you know media was in daily papers, and now they've all gone too. But um, 
at one point you could, you'd buy a, a paper and it would say Keef, the K W E F. You'd know it's and music people would know. Yeah, they didn't need in a daily paper they'd say Keith Richards in brackets, guitarist of the Rolling Stones, <laughs> a R and B band begin, beginning in London in 1962, formed by Brian Jones and Ian Stewart. Yeah. They, ha- they, they have to assume that nobody's interested in music. But a music culture magazine is, is great to read. So uh, all of those cultural things have gone. You know, they make movie. There's a movie out about Cream magazine now. There's a movie they made about a journalist from Rolling Stone magazine. You know, that's, that's uh, in a way really poor. Mm. <laughs> they yeah. used to be just well, I, well, I remember when I was a kid, uh, Duke was a, one of the yes. magazines. And a weekly a music, weekly mag- music magazine. Yes, out I, of Melbourne. Yeah, and I used to buy that with my cricket um, magazine or my footy mm. magazine or whatever. I'd have both and uh, they'd be specific for those particular industries, you know. Yeah, and uh, if you see old uh, music magazines like that, they had classified sections, musicians wanted and venues and musical equipment. And uh, I have some from the 80s that are hilarious, like uh, equipment ones, and they have reviews of venues by road crews of, uh, of the, uh, the, uh, what the people who run it are like, how, the, how easy it is to get gear in and out, what the power supply is like wow <laughs> so, the so they were very descriptive in uh what they were um detailing very, yeah uh practical yeah as well as amusing in many yeah, ways totally but uh, yeah so a lot of those music culture things disappeared as as it all uh atomized into uh just some uh whirling kind of dust of cultural junk and um but classic, but radio was, was ha, turned its back on presenting new music and Australian music too, which which I think is that I mean they thrust it all onto the ABC and Triple J and uh, community radio. But the the reach of uh, some of those commercial stations can be very powerful. Well. Mm. Thanks, Dave. Um, that's pretty much uh, all I've got for you today. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah. I appreciate your time. I know you sort of got stuff to do, and uh, I appreciate the time you've taken out to be part of this. It's terrific. <laughs> no worries, Pete. Yeah. yeah. All right, mate. Thanks very okay. much. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries, Pete. All the best. All the best to you, mate. Thank you. Okay. Bye then. You must have cast a spell.